to the bridge. Eighteen or nineteen, unshaven with backpack, he stops me on the quiet park trail, asks, where can I send him that's more secluded? Is there a place where no one goes? We're alone on the path, and I'm trained to give him anything he wants. Walk west, I say, towards the ocean. It's only a mile, maybe two, hoping that's the end of it. Can you repeat that, he asks. Finally, I retrieve my hands from deep fleece pockets and point. There, go down the hill, keep walking. See those woods? That's west. He thanks me, turns away. While the rest of us keep following designated trails in our branded athletic shoes, measuring what remains of an afternoon, Light pokes accusatory fingers into every crevice. Someone's son walks west, gaining on the Golden Gate Bridge, where so many beautiful boys fly. I may have drawn this one a map. My shame. My shame bears its midriff, the white of one eye, drops its head at the zap of conscience, we're told animals do not feel but oh yes, they do, and how. Do not be misled by its overall affability, expressed at times by compulsive embracing, nor how it shapes itself to your back's curve when you most need soothing to sleep. Stubborn as a root, my shame is, wily, pointless to confront, since it always weeps when cornered, sucking up your sympathy just to make it stop. My shame reads your most intimate letters, would sell your birthright downriver, spends your collectible coins, and is probably cutting your favorite clothes into small squares as we speak, blaming you for everything while it ruins your best pair of scissors. My shame is shameless. Just ask after those scissors and watch the sobbing start. Sanctuary. At first that howl suggests an overbearing parent on the sidelines of a girl's soccer game. But no, it's coming from the park lit across the street, somebody homeless or off their meds, shrieking from a bush in waves. Weekenders look alarmed. A few pause, then shrug and move on. Others hurry to cross against the light. Here in the sanctuary city, a person has the right to be miserable. Need to drown out voices in your head? You too can be a howler. No law against it. So unless he sets fire to a native tree, another matter entirely, subject to the purview of a different city department, it's ethical to simply keep walking away from this man who hides in plain view, like a two-year-old who secretly wants to be found. Last Baby Girls of the 1920s. Patsy, Dominica, Lois, Henny, Pearl. One by one, then seemingly at once, our mother's dear friends have tossed away their canes and medical apparatus and shuffled off without us girls of the 20s and 30s, era of the well-turned ankle, then the crash, the war, the rest. Among them, the boss's daughter, two British war brides, a single mother of three, a cellist, a secretary, one who buried two husbands and moved in with a third, another who always wrapped her neck in bright scarves as if maimed, though she wasn't. Their circumstances privileged or pinched, they ran shops or houses, or worked for people who ran shops or houses. Remembering them, I'm ambushed by the scent of cut peonies, by cups and saucers on a tray, biscuits, by their slow, deliberate kindnesses, and this wild longing for one more floral note card in careful cursive which always began, Julie Darling, 
or David dear, and made us want to be worthy. Blue Heron Walking Not one of Mr. Balanchine's soloists had feet this articulate. The long bones explicitly spread, then retracted, even more finely detailed than Leonardo's plans for his flying machines. And all this for a stroll, a secondary function, not the great dramatic spread and shadow of those pterodactyl wings. This walking seems determined less by bird volition or calculations of the small yellow eye than by an accident of breeze, pushing the bird on a diagonal, the great feet executing their tendus and lifts in the slowest of increments, hesitation made exquisitely dimensional, as if the feet thought themselves, through each minute contribution to propulsion, these outsized apprehenders of grasses and stone, snatchers of mouse and vole, these mindless magnificence that any time now will trail their risen bird like useless bits of leather. Don't show me your soul, Balanchine used to say. I want to see your foot. How to avoid huge ships. In lieu of faith, there were books. As my mother kept dying, I looked things up, assembling a glossary of hopeless causes, which occasioned frequent walks to and from the branch library. On the last day of January, I was returning the trauma of everyday life planning to borrow orphaned adults when I passed a brightly tattooed young woman reading on her stoop. I needed a sign, and she was deep in the dead do not improve. So I jettisoned my list of self-help titles, those my father called guides for the insane, and checked out how to avoid huge ships instead. In Captain Trimmer's most fervent desire that this book serve as guide and best friend when you find yourself in a tight situation with the large ship, I found some solace. Such lumbering vessels, he remarks, are slow to turn. They can be very difficult to stop.